Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have that grand privilege of looking together into this holy book that God has given us, the Bible. The Bible, which is a message from God to each and every one of us, to you and to me, to every human being in the whole uh, whole world. And uh, the pity is that we don't recognize how important it is so very frequently we we think well i'll read it when i get a chance or or maybe sometime uh, and when we do read it we we uh, find that it's difficult to understand and so we uh, get tired of it very very quickly and then it's quite some time before we pick it up again and oh my it's a shame because if we really realize what God is telling us in the Bible, we would realize how tremendously important it is. And that's why I'm so grateful that on this program we can go from one question to the next question concerning what we are reading in the Bible so that we might have better understanding. And that better understanding doesn't come because any of us are smart or any of us have a high IQ of some kind. It's only as we have been praying the Lord for wisdom because He has to open our eyes to the truth of the Bible. But shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, go ahead with your question. Yeah, um... I'm kind of interested in a couple of things that you said. And number one is Matthew 3, verse 3. Matthew 3. 14, chapter 3, 14 and 15. Ma- you, yeah, let me turn to that a moment. Matthew chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. But John... Oh, Jesus, uh, let's start, pick up the context. Uh, uh, John the, the Baptist is by the Jordan River, and he's warning the Jewish people that they have to repent of their sins and be ceremonially washed to, as a picture, a portrait of what salvation is. They have to have their sins washed away, just as they, as water will wash away the dirt from their flesh. And then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And uh, John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And uh, he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, what is your question? Well, my question is that a lot of times you say that that baptism isn't that important, and that's what I'm getting out of it, And and I'm trying to understand why you're saying that. Because the follow-up on that is Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, where, where Jesus Lord, went all to the world in heaven. Making believers, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Well, now you see, uh, there were ceremonial laws that were signs pointing to spiritual truth. And one of the ceremonial laws was that of water baptism in Jesus case it was an, it was a baptism that had to be or a washing that was a ceremonial washing that a high priest had to undergo or go before he did his work as a high priest uh, and but there was no no spiritual cleansing in that you can you can wash yourself in water or dip yourself or pour it on you all day long and that's not going to wash away a single sin but uh, but the baptism 
that is that is really all of this that is this kind of baptism is pointing to is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that is the washing away of our sins and so when the Bible says go into all the world baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit water baptism doesn't bring anybody into a saved relationship with God all that can do is wash some dirt away uh, but it is a sign pointing to the fact yes just as that person was was baptized in water so we have to have our sins washed away but that is the action of God himself that command in Matthew 28 was really saying uh, go, go out into all the world with the gospel uh, so that through the gospel there will be people who will have their sins washed away they will be baptized into the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit it is not talking about water baptism that isn't the end that isn't the end of the gospel that is only a sign that's only a uh, an indicator of that this that we have to have our sins washed away but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum welcome to open forum the number to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Hello, Welcome hello, to Open hello, Forum. Hello, Camping. I just wanted to make a quick suggestion. Yes, go ahead with your question. I mean, su no, uh, suggestion. I don't have any question, but uh, if you don't have... Uh, enough time to answer the question of your last caller is it possible to answer it on your next open forum if you don't have enough time for last caller could you answer it on the next open forum uh, I, I, I'm sorry you mean uh, I will take whatever time to answer the question trying to answer it as carefully as possible and uh, uh, if for example it was a question oh okay let's uh, you're talking about the last caller on the open forum and we didn't get into an answer well I may or may not I don't know it depends on the, how serious I think the question is if it's a if it's a very good question that we might benefit a lot of people. I, I may try to remember to do that. Thank you for the suggestion. Thank you. And thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Could you please turn to First Corinthians chapter 1? First Corinthians. And which verse? Uh, could you please read the first part of verse 18 and verse 23, the whole verse? Uh, verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to unto, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And uh, in verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified, whom the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. Now, what is your question? In, in verse 18, in both of those verses, it talks about the cross as being foolishness and the crucifixion of Christ as being foolishness. And, and have you ever thought about how um, April 1st is known, at, which is the day you said that uh, Christ was crucified in 33 A.D., happens to be All Fools Day. Is there? Have you ever thought about that? Oh, absolutely not. April Fools Day is not a is not something that the Bible talks about. That is simply a, a custom that's in our country uh, for whatever reason and. Uh, and why it is why that is picked out as a as a uh, April Fool's Day, uh, I have no idea. I don't know what the history of that particular custom 
might be. It certainly was not based on no, a knowledge that Christ hung on the cross on April 1 because that kind of time uh, information had, had, has only been available in the last few years. So uh, uh, it, uh, that, uh, the best I can say about all of that is it's just as coincidental. Okay. Thank you for taking the time to do this program every day. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Brother Camping. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Uh, quick question. Uh, May 21st, 2011, uh, beginning of Judgment Day. I've got three younger daughters, and uh, I'm kind of wondering, I don't, I don't know how to, t I don't know if I should tell them about it, or should I just leave it alone and not, don't, you know, don't warn them, or what, what should I do about that? Oh, uh, there's no question at all. Our children are entitled to know the score, the, the whole business, just as much as the adult. It's a terrible thing not to tell our children. They have to know about this. Uh, and, uh, you know, children understand a lot more than we give them credit for. And they uh, absolutely, you want to be telling them all the details and you want to be uh, be. Uh, praying for them that maybe God might open their spiritual eyes. You want to encourage them to pray that they might become a child of God before it's too late. It's it's a terrible thing to withhold that from our children. Even though you might think, well, I know, but we don't want to burden our children with all of this. Come on, they're going to face it, and uh, and uh, they can a child. A child can cry out to God for mercy. Believe you me, a two-year-old, a three-year-old can already begin to pray in their own way. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me that I might be your child also. Okay. Okay, thank you, Brother Camping. Have a great evening. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hey, Mr. Camping, uh... I was just listening, and the gentleman that was asking about baptism earlier, if he'll Google Andy Stanley and listen to his online message of baptism, it's, it's broken down in, in pretty good terms, layman terms, where just about anybody can understand it, and the importance of baptism and how people are fooled by children being baptized, babies, infants that don't even know anything. Well, that, I have, That doesn't I, take them to yeah. heaven. I just the, thought I'd bring that up. The, excuse me. Uh, the churches have made a very, very, all the churches, very strong uh, uh, tie-in to water baptism. You can enter or go into many uh, church buildings, and right in the center of the, pulp, of the platform behind the where the preacher is preaching is a beautiful baptismal tank and so on and the idea and all kinds of doctrines have been spawned in connection with that you go down into the water with your sins you come up without your sins or if you if, if it's a church where they baptize babies it gets rid in one denomination it that that takes away original sin and in another one it says that if you baptize the baby that they that baby somehow enters into a covenant relationship with Christ all of this is absolutely contrary to the Word of God. Absolutely. You can baptize all you want in any way you want, as beautifully a way as you want. But all of it is physical work that we're doing that is a demonstration or a sign pointing to the fact, just as that wa water washes away dirt from the skin, so we have to have... Christ to wash away our sins, and that is totally spiritual. It has it has had nothing to do with the activity of water baptism. The water baptism is only a sign. It makes absolutely zero contribution to the washing away of our sins, and the churches do not understand that. Uh, That's right. Most churches don't. Some do. If but. if if they, yeah, yeah, I I have never run into the church that does, 
And, well, listen and, to Andy Stanley out of Atlanta, Georgia, North Point. Well, Ministry. okay. His, his, the way he preaches may, about baptism. May, 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 maybe so, but if he's still in the church, he doesn't understand the Bible because the Bible says that God is not in the church. The Bible says that Satan is ruling there. And if he's still connected with a local congregation, it means that he has his own gospel, not the gospel of the Bible, even though he, he uh, tr tries to be uh, faithful to the Bible, but he's not listening to the whole Bible. Well, yeah. uh, you might want to listen to him before you make those predictions. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Awesome. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, welcome to Open Forum. Hello, good night, Dr. Campion. I'd like to ask a question uh, regarding the uh, sacrifice that Christ made before the foundation of this world. Yes. If uh, the Christ had made this sacrifice before the foundation of this world, why is it Abraham and uh, Isaac and the others have to make blood sacrifice? Why do they have to make blood sacrifice? Oh, because these were all signs. You remember, uh, Christ has done this stupendous thing before the foundation of the world. Now he creates the world. And so he, uh, uh, he sets up pictures or portraits of what had to have happened in, in order that we might become saved. Uh, when they slaughtered a lamb, for example, on the altar and burned it on the altar, it was pointing uh, to Christ who had shed his blood, who was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All of the ceremonial laws were types and shadows, pictures, portraits, pointing to what Christ had done already before he ever created the world uh, just as water baptism in the New Testament points to the fact that we have to have our sins washed yeah, away but, in the but, Old Testament it was circumcision we have to have the foreskin of the reproductive cut off uh, organ cut off as a picture picture that we have to have our sins cut away yeah but but when he made the sacrifice wasn't it for everyone so that means Abraham and Isaac, etc., should have been uh, should have been included also. No, no, no. That is contrary to the Bible. Christ made the payment for the sins of those who are chosen, the ones who are the elect of God, and uh, that represents about maybe two or three percent of the human race of our day. And, and they are called the elect. And, and they are the ones who eventually God had to save, well, either as a little baby or as a, a middle-aged person or an hour before they were uh, died. He had to save. He had to give them their eternal soul in which they would live with Christ forever more because their sins had been paid for. That's what we call salvation. And then he also guarantees that they will also on May 21 receive their glorified spiritual bodies in which they will live with Christ forevermore. And all of this was met, prepared before Christ ever created the world. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Mr. Camping, <clears throat> Revelation 10, 7. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. There we read. Revelation chapter 10. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Yeah, now, what is your question? Okay, so my question is, uh, would the seventh angel, would that mean uh, complete message? And seven means completeness, and angel means messenger. That's my question. Yeah, that's complete. In other words, when the seventh angel, there isn't an eighth angel that's going to sound. It means that we now have learned all that we, that, uh, that God 
as planned and it, and it, and it will be happening. In other words, God's salvation plan will have been finished and all the believers will be with Christ in heaven, in body and in soul, uh, and there will be no more salvation any longer uh, anywhere in this world. And the day of judgment has come, and it's going to run its course in over a period of five months. Every, all the mystery is gone. It's all, uh, all, everything that has been a mystery. And oh my, there's so much in the Bible that has been a mystery, and a lot of that mystery has been unfolding right in our day as we have come to more and more understanding of the details of the end. Uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Kim. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I'd like to uh, go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11. Verse 27. Verse 27. Let's look at that. Matthew 11. Verse 27. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now, what is your question? Uh, my question is, if no one knows the Son, is he talking about at the time he was alive or and doing his preaching? or uh, I'm trying to understand why he would say no one knows the Son. Except well, the any, more, any more than nobody knows the Father. Well, how much do we know about Almighty God? And remember, Jesus was Almighty God. The Father is Almighty God. We, we right there, we don't understand uh, that, uh, that uh, there's one God, and yet uh, God reveals himself as Almighty God as the Father, and Almighty God as the Son, and as and also as the Holy Spirit. That's a great big mystery. We don't understand. How do we, what do we know about God? That He is able. In six days of time that we read about in Genesis chapter 1, create the millions of life forms that are so complex uh, that make up this universe. And, and, uh, it, uh, and He just spoke. And brought all that into being. How do we? How, how much do we really know about an infinite God? That's why whenever the Bible talks about God, uh, whether He's talking about Christ or whether He's talking about the Holy Spirit, very, very humbly and respectfully, we say, "Oh Lord, I read what You're saying. I know it's absolutely true, but please, I don't understand. How can I understand?" an infinite God and all that he is and and uh, uh, it's and it, God does reveal something about himself to us we were able to to know something but my we're only scratching the surface and we certainly uh, can never say we know a whole lot about him okay and the one to whom the son wills to reveal him uh uh, that is Jesus revealing God to us? Well, whenever whenever we become saved, we are, God has revealed to us our Savior is God. And we our eyes are open to all kinds of truth in the Bible. If we're not saved, there's, there's a, like the Bible uses a figure, a veil over our eyes, and we know very, very, uh, little of what the Bible is teaching. When we become saved, many things open up to us. Uh, that's why, uh, as we are sharing the gospel on family radio, we have people who call and they just don't understand. And and we have to realize, well, okay, it isn't because they are inferior or because they are stupid or because they're and, uh, uh, just the sour grapes or whatever it simply means that God has not opened their spiritual eyes. And when we can begin to really see the magnificence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the magnificence of God, and we can begin to understand something about salvation, it's only because God has opened our eyes. 
But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Hello? Forum. Hello? Yes, go ahead with your call. Uh, I can't hardly hear you. Hello? Yes, go ahead with your call. Okay. Uh, what I'm concerned about, I hear you use the rapture word. And you are a real, you know, stick to the Bible issue. And I have never read the word rapture in the Bible. Oh, excuse me. Again and again, you will hear me when I, uh, not always, but just quite frequently, when the, when the believers are caught up. Because that is what the rapture is all about. That word rapture is the theological term that all the churches have adopted. If they're members of a congregation, they know what the word rapture is. But I'm, in fairness to the, the issue, outside of the church, out in the world, they've never heard that word. And so uh, you are. that's why, again and again, when I talk about the rapture, I'm, I use the term at the time that the true believers, uh, their bodies will be caught up to be with Christ. But we've got to pause now. We're continuing with the open forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to open forum. Hey, hi, Mr. Ben. How are you doing tonight? Yes, go ahead with your call. Yes, I have a quick question. Uh, so all of the chosen ones, they were selected before the foundation of the world, right? were selected before Christ ever created the world, yes. Yes, so what is the reason then for um, preaching the gospel, going to, Af going to Africa, going to, the, to all of the places, if it, all of the chosen ones are already selected? So what is the meaning of, of preaching the gospel and crying for mercy? Because if according to you, everyone is chosen already, so there is no need for preaching, there is no need for crying for crying for help well there's no that's that's uh, uh, that's because God is the one who has set the whole program up mankind did not now there are several things that happen as we send the gospel out into the world first of all uh, we those who are selected by God who be and have had their sins paid for must hear the gospel before God will uh, give them their, uh, their eternal souls in which they will live with Christ in heaven forevermore. Uh, the Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and faith in that context, it's in Romans chapter 10, is a, a synonym for Christ himself. He is the faithful one. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So as we send out the gospel into the world, those whom God has elected and already made payment for their sins will eventually come under the hearing of the word and that God will apply that word to their hearts and give them a, an eternal soul in which they'll live with Christ forevermore. That's what we call salvation. Yeah, then, secondly, excuse me, excuse me. Secondly, secondly, uh, the rules of the Bible are given to mankind for the benefit of mankind, even though they are not a, a uh, uh, elected by God. God has put mankind, uh, I'm talking now about those who were not elected, those who simply live out their lives and die. Uh, in the measure that they obey the rules of the Bible, they will enjoy more blessings in this world uh, and if and the bible is uh, gives them rules to live by when they learn that it's a sin to commit adultery uh, that uh, when you're married you stay married and and uh, uh, you you shall not hate and and so on all of these laws are spelled out and in the measure that mankind follows those rules he will also have much more possibility of enjoying this world and and living at peace with his fellow man. And so the Bible is a very, very beneficial book also to all of the unsaved. And, uh, and we don't normally recognize this, but, but the, that is the character 
of the Bible. And thirdly, it is simply God's command. Now, God has other reasons also. We may, may, he may have reasons we don't even know about. We don't question God. We don't take God to task. Now, why did you do that? We say, oh, I see. You are our, our great ruler. We want to be obedient to you altogether. Just not to reason why, but to do or die, like the old phrase goes. Uh, we do it because God wants it. And we know it is all, always the best when we obey him. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Camping. I've been listening to you for several decades and have certainly uh, grown in the Word because of your teachings and showing how to study the Bible. But you just said something that really confused me. I have heard you say many times before that many people on the earth who are will become saved or are saved haven't heard the gospel at all. And you just now told that man that that people have to hear the gospel in order to become saved. Now, which is it? I'm telling you, I never, never, never taught that you could become saved without hearing the gospel. Now, there have been those who, uh, have, who have taught that. There have been those who have taught that. But you have never, never heard me teach that. I've taught wrong things in the past because of things I had been taught in the church I belonged to, and I trusted that for many years of my life. But, but that was one that was never, never taught by me. The fact is that it requires the hearing of the Word of God before God can make that person his child, or that is, uh, give him an eternal soul. That is a, that is a uh, law that God has established. That work for a one-day-old child that dies. But how does that work for what? A one-day-old child that dies. Oh, well, the fact is that that child, uh, uh, we're, God, we're not talking about physical ears now. What about a deaf person? Uh, it, you have to be under the hearing of the word. God is the one who applies that word to the heart of that baby, that unborn baby or that per baby that uh, uh, if, if God intends to save, uh, that baby should be under the hearing of the Word. That's why all my life I've encouraged people, uh, when you uh, find that your wife is with child, make sure you keep family radio going so that that child is under the hearing of the Word. And because God makes the application, mankind doesn't do it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Um, yes, um, I had a question. Like, probably three, four or more years back, I played with a Ouija board. And I think that I had maybe an evil spirit enter me. And I know that you say, I mean, the Bible discourages, you know, going to the churches, that Satan is the ruler there. And I was wondering if you would have any suggestion as to what I might do. I mean, I don't know, because I guess I can't see a minister for it. Well, excuse me, you know, the fact is that if we look back at our life, we have done many uh, very sinful things. Sometimes we look back and we say, oh, how stupid I was that I did this or I did that. Uh, but that's the true of every one of us. None of us can look back at our whole lifetime and say, oh, I always lived so righteously before God. There never was any real dumb thing that I ever did. That would be nothing but stupid pride to, to uh, try to uh, take that position. The fact is we look back and some things we remember and more vividly than others. We don't know why certain things stick in our mind, but they are there. But that's, that, that, that's no problem. When we become a child of God, we know, or as we hear the gospel, we recognize that when we become saved, every, every dirty, rotten sin, however dumb or however, uh, however uh, 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 much we were involved in or whatever, it's all taken care of. Christ has 
uh, made the payment for what is demanded by the law of God so that we don't stand guilty before God and and the proof of that we are that we have become saved is that we now find that we have an intense desire to do the will of God to do the law of God we're not a bit comfortable when we fall into a sin we 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 uh, we fear God that is that we we we're not fearful that we'll go to hell we're fearful that we might b- betray our Lord and Master by committing sin. We don't. We we in our love for Him, we know sin is and God don't add up together. We want to live as righteous as we possibly can, and therefore we're so grateful. For example, like there's a verse in Philippians chapter two where God says, "For it is God who works in us to will and to do of His good pleasure." Wow. That means that we can pray every day and should be praying every day. Oh, Lord, you know, you know I need your strength. And uh, will you work in me to will and to do of your good pleasure? Because I don't trust me. Uh, I, I am still part of this world. And, uh, and we can beseech him and beg of him that he will strengthen us. Uh, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, uh, Brother Campin. First of all, I just want to say it was so nice meeting you, um, first of all, my, my husband and I. But, you know, I'm still wondering, we said that the elect will reign with Christ. Exactly what does that mean? I mean, will reigning with Christ, will it be somebody that... That the, that the that to be written over, or what well, is reigning with Christ? You know, that's a tremendous uh, a statement eh? that we will reign with Christ. We will, in the new heaven and the new earth, we will be kings reigning with Christ. Over what? In, in one of the parables, Christ spoke about someone uh, that. Uh, who was a true believer would someday be reigning over two cities and another one over five cities uh, and I don't know whether we can understand that literally or not I doubt it but we will be reigning in some way over what we got there's, <laughs> there's going to be surprise after surprise after surprise but we will not be there as uh, uh, we, we will be there uh, right there with the Lord Jesus. He reigns. He's seated at the right hand of God. And we, in principle, will be seated with him, uh, reigning. And how all of that is, it is way, way beyond our imagination. We have no way of really figuring it out. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. It's Mark 2, verse 19. Mark 2, verse 19. Let's look at that. Mark 2, verse 19. We read, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Now, what is your question? What does the word fast mean? Well, God explains this in of all places in uh, Isaiah 58. Let me let me turn back to that, and and uh, God describes about what that fast will be. In the Old Testament, it was the fast meant to uh, to go without food uh, during the day of of atonement uh, uh, but uh, but in uh, in uh, when he, when God got, got around to talking about the New Testament uh, then it, the fast is something entirely different let's look at Isaiah 58 where God says uh, in verse 6 is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, 
and so on. Now, you notice that all of this is parabolic language pointing to what happens when we share the gospel with others. When we're bringing the gospel, we are uh, bringing food, spiritual food, to spiritual hungry. We are clothing the spiritual naked with uh, providing the clothing of the covering of the Lord Jesus. This is what the fast is. Now that when the bridegroom was here, when Christ was demonstrating in 33 A.D. in those years while he was preaching in the uh, in, uh, in in Palestine, in uh, Galilee, and so on, uh, uh, the, he he did he did train the uh, twelve apostles. He did train seventy uh, seventy people to go out just to. Uh, to to train them for the task, but insofar as giving the command that everybody was to go out and into the world and uh, and uh, begin the church age, no, no. But once Christ went back to heaven, or the bridegroom left, then on the day of Pentecost that came a few days after Christ descended into heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out, and then began the whole task of the New Testament believers to fast, that is, to share the gospel with the world. And very quickly, it began to go out into Asia and uh, to uh, Greece and to uh, 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 Turkey and other countries. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. First Timothy four ten. First Timothy four ten. Let's look at that. There we read. For therefore you we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. And what is your question? If he is the savior of all men why do you say that he's picking and choosing men today I, we, and in john three seventeen. well excuse me let me explain something uh, when we read the word all or every we have to be very careful for example in first corinthians 15 verse 22 i believe it is we read there that as in Adam all die. That, now that, that is excuse a me, death. excuse me, excuse That's, me. As in Adam all die. That means every human being, we all experience physical death. So, and then it goes on. So in Christ shall all, same word all, be made alive. Well, now, if that meant every human being, it mean, would mean that there would be no one under the wrath of God. Uh, God would not talk about the day of judgment because that's when all kinds of people will go to receive the final wrath of God and uh, uh, because all have been made alive. So what do we have to remember? When God uses the word all, we have to think now, what does the rest of the Bible permit as far and so far as understanding that all so in Christ shall all that Christ has saved be made alive uh, and that that's that would be all the elect now likewise in first Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men which all men all that he had come to save and the next phrase explains that especially of uh, those that believe that is that God has caused to become saved uh, to begin to trust in him uh, they are the ones that are the all that is in view but not in any way could it be could it, could it be we would have total chaos with an, our understanding of the Bible if that all meant every human being. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother. Uh, yes. At, uh, Genesis 6, um, 1 to 4. 
Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Genesis 6. Verse 1, 2, 4. There we read. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose. And Jehovah said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth of those in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men with, which were of old men of renown. Now, what is your question? Well, my question is, what does that mean? I mean, I, I don't understand how how, the, how they could um, uh, be old men of renown. But they it sounds like mythology. Like you know, they 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 came down from heaven and they 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 took the uh, the the uh, wives them as wives. No, excuse me. The sons of God, we have to remember, we compare Scripture with Scripture. And yeah. so we search the Bible. Where does it talk about, uh, in the human race, this is talking about something going on uh, uh, on planet Earth. Where do we read about sons of God? Well, we go to Romans 8, for example, and we find that the true believers, they're adopted into the family they they are adopted as sons of god and so effectively god is saying when it's the true believers there were some uh noah and his family they were true believers and this already began 120 years before the flood and had been going on for years before that and so there were uh, some true believers and they saw the daughters of men. Now, the daughters of men were those who are just unsaved people. And uh, they, uh, she was, she is so beautiful. And, oh, she comes from a noble family. And, uh, and uh, we have fallen in love. And so the next thing here is a true believer marrying someone who is not a true believer. And God here, which later on in the New Testament, remember, he gave the rule you are not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever uh, because here God describes or gives us a real tremendous lesson as to where this is going to go. If you marry an unbeliever, the likelihood is that your family is going to go farther and farther away from God. Even though if you are a true believer, you won't lose your salvation, but your children uh, and, and in your accommodation to your unsaved wife or unsaved husband, uh, you're going to be uh, having a lot, way more of the world in your home than you should have. And this will be training for your children. And and uh, and the direction is going to be away from God, nor ordinarily, not toward God. And that is what was happening. Wickedness was developing in the world of that day. And, uh, and the world was getting so wicked that God said, I'm going to destroy it. And as a matter of fact, 120 years later, when the flood came, uh, there were only eight individuals in the whole world of that day, which might have had as many as a million people in it, only eight that were still true believers. Well, thank you very much, brother. I lived to you for years, and you always helped me out an awful lot. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. I couldn't believe I got through. I'm sorry, what is your question? Um, Malachi. Malachi. Um, the last chapter. Malachi, let's turn to that. Malachi chapter 4 and which verse? Um, the verse that speaks about Elijah 
Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, what is your question? Uh, could you compare that with um, Ecclesiastes verse 1? I mean, chapter 1. Let me turn to that. Uh, Ecclesiastes. Yes, chapter 1, in which verse? Um, verse 10 and 11, or 9, 10, 11. 9 to 11, the thing that hath been, is that it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, and so on. Now, what is your question? Um, it seems like um, Elijah was reincarnated. So, does everybody become reincarnated? Because in Ecclesiastes, it says that there's no new thing under the sun. And then there's no remembrance of former things. So, oh, you don't remember uh, your uh, past life. Uh, excuse me. Reincarnation is not taught anywhere in the Bible. There, you, to begin with your... This, uh, uh, answering your question, we know absolutely it's not talking about the reincarnation of Elijah. An illustration of this, however, is given us in, I think it's in Luke chapter 1, where we read in uh, verse 17, chapter 1, verse 17, John the Baptist is going to be born to, uh, uh, to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Uh, the, old, uh, the old couple and, uh, and he is told in verse 17 and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord and that ties right back to what we read in Malachi chapter 5 chapter 5 uh, that he would send Elijah it was not a reincarnation of Elijah. He would send a prophet that was similar to Elijah. In this case, it was John the Baptist. Now, in our day, God has raised up many prophets who are uh, really fulfilling the role of Elijah in that they are have understood that we're at the end and we have to warn the world that, that we're at the end. And as we do that, we are, uh, we are walking in the shoes of Elijah, uh, that the world is, is warning the world that Judgment Day is almost here. But thank, oh, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Uh, can you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1? Ecclesiastes chapter 1 yes in which verse uh, just uh, verse 4 verse 4 one generation passeth away and another generation cometh but the earth abideth forever now what is your question and could you please compare that to Ephesians chapter 3 Ephesians chapter 3, and which verse? Uh, verse 9 and 10. There we read, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the principalities and powers in the heavenlies might be made might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now hold on, we're, we're almost ready for a break and I'll be right back with you right after that break. We have a caller on the line who has given us Ecclesiastes 1 verse 4 and Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 and 10 uh, to look at and now I want to ask him what is your question concerning these verses? Oh, the question. Um, well, there was a caller earlier today that asked you uh, why in the world would God 
do all this, sending forth the gospel, have a nation by his name, and a church age, and whatsoever, if all the elect were named before the foundation of the world, and I was waiting for you, because I know you know the answer real well, you always teach that this is a gigantic demonstration by God, and all the heavens are watching what's going on. That is correct. Okay, I just wanted to give you some, uh, so you could tell everybody right now about that giant demonstration because I learned it from you and it was a big eye opener yeah, well of sense. the fact is this 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 is a, big, a fairly big subject but you wonder why did God create this world and uh, and know ahead of time because he already had made arrangements to save a small percentage of the people that would come into existence he knew that his the first couple that he created, Adam and Eve, would rebel against him and come under the wrath of God, and that in turn would cause all the people that stem from him, because they're all, all of us are in his bloodline, be, to come into this world as rebellious sinners, uh, that, because we're all of the nature of Adam and Eve. And uh, why did God put up with all this? And and uh, then as we search the Bible and we read about Old Testament Israel, how God labored with that and how often he was, uh, and how often he was uh, uh, patient with them and how often he uh, brought his wrath upon them and, uh, and then he was patient again and he forgave them and so on. And then they, we've gone through the church age and so on. And, and uh, we, we, we wonder, why did God do all this? And the reason is, and this finally is a very, very, very big truth. The whole business of this planet Earth and of this universe and, and all that's going on was f finally there to demonstrate to whomever uh, uh, God had ever created in times past, after all, uh, he is eternal God from everlasting past. And there may be many, many other creations that we know nothing about. But they're all watching here. And, and what they're looking at is the demonstration of the wonderful attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he deals so personally with individuals as well as whole nations and uh, all through these 13,000 years of time putting up with all the nonsense of mankind and the rebellion of mankind and, and how he forgave and how, and, and how he again uh, 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 was, was kind and, and so on and, and it's all in order to enhance the glory of the Lord Jesus the final focus of this world is to glorify the Lord Jesus how great and wonderful he is but shall we go to our next call please welcome to open forum welcome to open forum yeah uh, Mark 13 20 Mark 13 verse 20 Mark 13. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he had chosen, he had shortened the days. Now, what is your question? It clearly says God saves only the chosen. It ain't our choice, it's his. Yes, but he, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened. Yeah, well, it says that here, and it says it in other places too. Uh, this is this. Uh, this you're, you're correct. This is a very plain statement that those who were elected had been chosen of God, and and uh, that is in complete harmony with everything that the Bible teaches. And thank you for sharing that. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, brother Camping. Yes. Yeah, the um, reason I'm calling because I was trying to listen to you on my shortwave radio because that's the only way I can pick you up over here in Washington, North Carolina. And they had another program on there, and it kind of worried me there. But, you know, um, has there been a change in your program? 
I'm not aware there is, a, and and I don't know what's happening. You're you're in South Carolina. You're pretty close to Okeechobee, Florida, and and it may be, you know, one of the problems is the short wave. It's affected by sunspots, and sometimes, uh, I, you know, in your case, uh, no, I'm in I'm in North Carolina. North Carolina. How many yeah. hundred miles are you away from Okeechobee, Florida? Uh, quite a ways. I'm, I'm about 300 miles away from Charleston, South Carolina. I used to live in Charleston. I picked you up all the time. But the only way I can get you now is on the, on the short wave at 6987. Yeah, I really don't know what is happening. I really don't know at all. Uh, you might uh, mm, You might send a note... Uh, an address, uh, or uh, let me see, send a note to Family Radio, but but uh, address our uh, shortwave department, and uh, maybe they can refer that to Okeechobee, Florida, for an answer for you. We'll see once. Okay, because I was re- I look forward to hearing hearing you at open forum and hear you every night Monday through yeah. Friday. But uh, okay, bless you, brother. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I. I. I really don't know offhand. Okay. But thank, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah, I want to uh, ask you. Uh, the Jewish people use a lot of the. Uh, there's a parts in the Old Testament that they use why they don't believe in Jesus, and in particular, I want to hear your opinion on. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1, 2, and 3, and I'll just take your answer over the radio. Thank you. Uh, Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 3. Let's look at that. 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth he a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that rumor of dreams. For Jehovah your God proveth you, or he's testing you, to know whether ye love Jehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Uh, And uh, now, you see, God continually is testing the peoples of the world. Right now, for example, all of those in the churches are being tested uh, during this time of great tribulation as God is is showing us, for example, that Satan is ruling there. Are they are the people in the churches recognizing that? Uh, if they don't, they fail the test. Uh, do they understand what we've learned now that Christ was crucified or that he that he paid for our sins before he ever created the world. If they don't understand that, they have failed the test. In other words, only those who are really trusting the whole Bible and are recognizing that the whole Bible is right from the mouth of God uh, have any possibility of not failing the test because uh, the churches that uh, they long ago have uh, have limited their knowledge of the Bible to what God had given them prior to the end of the church age, prior to all of the information that he has now opened our spiritual eyes to. And they're trusting, therefore, what the the people in the churches are trusting what the church is teaching, not what the Bible is teaching. And so uh, it it is the fact that... uh, uh, God it, it, here in Deuteronomy is saying uh, you're, uh, you're being tested when someone is trying to attract you to follow some other God than the God of the Bible. And, and in fact is, in the churches, they really are trusting another God. It is, they're not trusting the God of the Bible because then they would want to, tr- to uh, listen to the whole Bible. They would be intensely interested in anything and everything the Bible teaches, but no, they're trusting a pastor, they're trusting a theologian, they're trusting their church doctrines or whatever. And these things become their God because that is where their trust is. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? 
Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Ms. Kenton? Yes. Okay. Will you please turn your radio off, please? Thank you. That will help. You said that uh, after five months, after, on May 11th, 2011, uh, that's the end of the world, the rapture, right? Well, I got uh, Revelation 11. How does that coincide with the 42 months of, uh, of suffering? Well, the 42 months are of Revelation 11 are symbolic. Uh, we know because of what the time is, uh, the uh, period of time that's in view. It's the Great Tribulation time, which uh, is, uh, we know from a very careful study of the Bible, it's 23 years. On the other hand, the five months is derived from uh, from uh, Revelation chapter 9, and there's nothing at all that suggests that it's anything but a literal time, and uh, then uh, we complete annihilation of the world. And in fact, uh, there is, there is uh, uh, I didn't say that quite accurately, uh, when, we, when we get all the information from the Bible, we know the date of the final end. It had to be the last day of the day of the, of the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, that that all fits into the the way God has designed the end of the world, and the last day of the Feast of the Tabernacles is October 21 in the year 2011, and that turns out to be exactly five months from May 21, 2011, and that agrees perfectly with the five months of Revelation 9. So it's all locked up together. We know, Mr. Tampton, I. Where is the 42 months? It says 42 months they were here. Not, yeah. You're making up your own stuff here. I'm, I'm reading what it says in the Bible. The 42 months. What is that? Well, let's look That's at like it. Now, years, now, excuse it? me. No, now I'll tell you. Now I notice. I just talked about the five months and showed you that it had to do with uh, with a feast days and it all came out exactly right on the target. Now in Revelation 11, it says in uh, in verse 2, uh, or we start with verse 1, There was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, the... We know from a lot of other information in the Bible that the holy city is are the, the local congregations. They have the Bible. They are the ones that uh, represented the kingdom of God to this world. We also know that the, that the great tribulation is when they were trodden down. And we learn from a lot of other information in the Bible that period was 23 years, exactly 8,400 days which is a full, exact 23 years. And that doesn't coincide with 42 months. And so we know without a, beyond a shadow of a doubt that the 42 months has got to be understood, has, has to be understood symbolically, just like in, in, uh, in Revelation chapter, uh, uh, in, in Revelation chapter 12. It talks about the, uh, the church age and, and uses the figure of 1260 days, which uh, if a month is 30 days long, that's also three and a half years, only it's not the same 42 months uh, or the three and a half years of, uh, of Revelation 11. It is now talking about a different period, and we know that the church age uh, extended over 1955 years, and that was typified by 1260 days, which are, is the same as 42 months. So we have to, in order to discover whether it's symbolical or whether it is actual, we have to get all the other scriptures that relate and bring them all to bear and harmonize and make sure that we are uh, not uh, abusing any of the scriptures, that we are not uh, fudging or, or misunderstanding and when we have harmony, then we know we have the truth. But you see, if you only look at that one verse, 
42 months and say, well, there it is. Any dumbbell can see that that's 42 months. And that's three and a half years. Well, sure. Uh, the Bible has a lot of verses like that, that when we first look at it, it looks like it's very simple to understand. But then when we follow the rule of comparing Scripture with Scripture to make sure we're our conclusion was in harmony with everything else. Then we find our first conclusion, even though it was so apparent that we had the truth, was not the truth at all. And that is that is the role of a teacher that he or a preacher that they should be really analyzing everything in the Bible uh, in order to teach truth. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Kenty. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, let me lower my radio. I'm sorry. I uh, forget about that. Uh, isn't it true that uh, people are not allowed to change anything, the interpretation of the Bible from the beginning of when Jesus Christ came? They're not allowed to change, first of all. We are not allowed to change any word that was in the original language. We can uh, check the translators. That was the work of men. Translation was not done under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, like the writing of the Bible. The writing of the Bible was a dictation right from the mouth of God. And so we don't ever dare to change that. But we can check the, tra the translator. Uh, and as we learn more and more about, uh, understand more of the Bible now and then, we'll find a verse where a word uh, can be or should be changed in order to be in harmony with, uh, uh, and yet we, we can't change the original word, but the original word may have two or three or four or five or six different possibilities. Prepositions, for example, are like that. They can, a preposition uh, can have maybe a half a dozen different possible uh, 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 solutions and and we have to find the one that fits the context the immediate context as well as the context of the whole Bible and so frequently a preposition uh, 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 can be corrected from uh, what was originally used or translated in the Bible but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Good evening. Yes. Uh, time, times and a half denotes the duration of the other horn of the fourth beast. It's not symbolic. Time, times and a half of 12-7 of Daniel speaks about the time to the end. Now, I can give you scripture after scripture that says 42 months seven-year tribulation period, yeah, not uh, 23 years. Excuse me, yes. You can find a few verses that seem to identify, but we got to remember, we have to we use the whole Bible. Harmony has to come when we understand the whole Bible. Now, God used that phrase 42 months or a time, times and a half in th several places, uh, which helps to tie those particular passages together. But that, that does not tell us everything that the Bible has to say about that time. Just as I already explained, uh, that, time, that 42 months in, in Revelation 11 uh, is actually a period of, of 23 years when we, harm, when we get into harmony with everything the Bible tells about that time. And, uh, and when we look at uh, uh, the 1260 days, uh, it's speaking about a period of 1955 years, but we only know that when we have a lot more information. And, um, you know, before this last 30 years or so, or particularly the last 22 years, there was no possibility of anybody being able to unravel all of this because it was not God's plan that we should know, that anybody should know the 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 the, the, the development of the timeline of, of history like, uh, like we know it today. But once we got past uh, the end of the church age in 1988, uh, then, then God opened our eyes to the book that is spoken of in Revelation 5, 
a book that had been sealed with seven seals. It was originally given to the book of to the uh, prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, and he was told it had to do with the time of the end and the details of the end, and he was told to seal it up. It's for the time of the end. And then in Revelation 5 and 6 and 7, and the first verse of Revelation 8, uh, that book is slowly unopened, and and then uh, the seventh seal comes off in Revelation 8, verse 1. And th that simply meant that there's a lot of information that God had written in the Bible that he had sealed up. He had written in such complex fashion and and uh, and uh, so that and he didn't uh, open the spiritual eyes of any Bible teacher, however holy, however righteous, however saved, however diligent that person may have been. And nobody could know uh, these answers until until the time. Uh, that in which we are presently living and that's why we have so much information today not because we're smarter or wiser than anybody in the past but simply because we're living at this day and God has instilled in our minds the fact that every word in the Bible is came from the mouth of God and is absolutely dependable and trustworthy and uh, and uh, but we until we find harmony between passages that we don't really know at all whether we have truth. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Kempe. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Mr. Kempe, I have a friend who wants to get married, and I just want to make sure that I understand your teaching. You said that, he, that, that the devil is ruling in the church. And if the devil is ruling in the church, you also teach that we have to flee from the church and go to the mountains or just flee anywhere in the world. But then, if, if I understand you correctly, you say that if we want to get married, we have to flee right back to the church where Satan is ruling. And Excuse I'm very me. Curious. Excuse me. I never said that, that we have to be married in a church. I said that in our country... There are two things that have ha that have to uh, that are a legal requirement. They have nothing to do with the church. First of all, there has to be a, a marriage license granted by the government, and secondly, there has to be someone who is licensed to marry, to to uh, to actually uh, uh, manage the the. Uh, the tying together that I pronounce you man and wife it has to be pronounced by someone who is licensed to marry licensed by the government not by a church now there are different individuals who have that kind of a license there are the justice of peace there are judges there are pastors there are preachers and if they have that kind of a license then they can marry now I uh, uh, you never want to go in and become a member of a church in order to get married in a church, but but a a church building is is kind of a nice building to get married in. You can use that building. It's only a building. It's only a building if you can rent it from from a congregation someplace, or you can get married in your garden, or you can get married by the seashore. You can get married any place you want to be. Secondly. Uh, you have to have to someone uh, who is licensed uh, pronounce the uh, the uh, uh, marry uh, the fact that now you are married. It can be a preacher. You're not coming under his spiritual rule at all. You're only using him uh, to be an, an a, a officer of the government to pronounce the fact that now you are married. But you don't you don't if 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 you went to a preacher and said, look. Could we use your church? Could we rent your church to be married? And he said, "Yes, you may, but, but you have to. Have, there are certain rules that we have to have that are certain. Uh, there's going to be a, there's going to be a baptism, or there's going to be a Lord's table that you have to partake." And so on. You say, "Oh no, no way, no way, no interest. We're not trying to become a member of your church. We only are interested in it as a building, and you as a." someone who is licensed and that's our only interest and if it's more than that then I'm sorry we, we can't use your church but thank you for calling and sharing 
And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Farm. Yes. Hi there. I was wondering, what is the best way for me to raise my 11-year-old son to ensure that he has the best chances to be with God in heaven? The best because way. Because say to avoid the churches that God has left the church in 1988, and me and my son, from time to time, we do frequent different churches. But what is your best advice on me raising, what should I do with my 11-year-old boy to better his chances? First of all, you pray for him again and again. You beseech the Lord, oh, Lord, would you have mercy on my son? And maybe, maybe, I know he doesn't deserve any more than I deserve salvation, but could it be that you might have mercy? You pray for him. Secondly, you, know, you don't, you don't live a life in rebellion. If you're visiting churches, you are going contrary to the law of God. You are uh, you are visiting Satan's citadels, his his palaces, and and you certainly don't want to do that. But you do want to tell your son about the situation that we're right at the end, and that uh, that Christ is coming. The end of the world is almost here. In other words, you want to clue him in to what the Bible is teaching. And uh, and pray for him as well as pray for yourself that you might indeed be a child of God. And then you have to wait upon the Lord. You can't get him saved. You can't get yourself saved. Only God uh, will save. But we can plead with him that maybe, maybe God in his mercy might save me, might save my son. And that's and we, you can keep pleading with God right up until May 21, 2011. And maybe God will have mercy. I have to say, good night.